Hi, this is Graham, and thanks for joining me for part three of this video tutorial series covering the Panasonic Lumix FZ200 camera. In part two, I looked at how the IA and IA Plus modes worked, and basically the camera used scene type determination to set the basic operating conditions of the camera, and then exposure metering to give you the final exposure. In contrast to that, today I'd like to look at the semi-automatic modes. They are the P, the A and the S modes. The P is the automatic exposure mode, S is shutter priority where you determine the shutter speed the camera will use, or the aperture priority and again you will determine the aperture the camera will use. There are some 25 or 26 options you can set when you're using the uh, semi-automatic modes in the menu system. I'm not going to go through all the menu items in this video, I'll just introduce them at the points where they're most relevant. So let's begin by setting up for the P mode and looking at the initial choices we should make in the menu. To enter the P or automatic exposure mode, we turn the top control dial to the P position and this is emulated on the back LCD screen by the rotation of the graphic user interface. We can see now the camera switch to the P mode and we have the P icon on the top left hand side of the screen. I mentioned in the introduction that the menuing system for the semi-automatic modes is quite extensive and extends over some six pages. If we enter into the menu you can see now along the top we have a six page menu of adjustments with five options on each page. I'll only highlight the ones in this menu system for the P mode and some of the specific tasks I will be doing. There is a shortcut to moving through the pages of the menu and that's to use the zoom lever on the top of the camera. If you use the zoom lever you can page forward or page back and it saves you having to scroll all the way through each menu to go to the next page. So for example if I use the zoom lever now and move to the right we'll access page 2 and again 3 four, five, six. And one more depress of the zoom lever will take me back to page one. So that's a shortcut to get you through the pages of the uh, setup menu. In the intelligent auto mode we just had four photo styles which were the standard, happy, black and white and sepia. Now in the semi-automatic modes we have a choice of six. And again we're in the first page of the menu and it is indeed setting up photo style. You can see we have an arrow to the right hand side which indicates there are more options. So again using the navigation key we can scroll to the right and it brings us up into the standard photo style and you can notice we have four additional parameters within that photo style we can actually customize for our own use. Those four options are the contrast and contrast it's just the difference between the dark and light in the subject. The more contrast you have, the greater the difference between the dark and light. Obviously, on the other side of that, we have a softer contrast, which is a minus value, and the difference between the darks and lights is less pronounced. We have a feature for adjusting sharpening, and again, the standard setup gives you a zero sharpening effect. You can customize that to any value between minus two and plus two. It's normally used in conjunction with noise reduction. Panasonic have quite an aggressive noise reduction algorithm and it's especially noticeable at higher ISOs. This manifests itself as a loss of fine detail and the image becomes smeared. There are some indications that if you set noise reduction to minus two, this removes some of that noise reduction and helps at the lower ISOs as well. So you can get finer detail in your pictures if you select noise reduction to minus two. Additionally, if you wanted to increase the sharpness of the picture, use that in conjunction with a plus value in the sharpening to increase the edge contrast of the image. The next option is the color saturation. And again, if you wanted to increase the color saturation of the colors, then you use a plus value. And if you want to mute the color slightly, use a minus value. So standard is the first photo style. If we cursor to the right again, we see now we have the vivid photo style and again the same four options you can customize. The next one is a natural profile and this is a 
softer profile with lower contrast so the camera reduces the contrast of the image you can of course adjust this by changing the amount of contrast applied to the subject by changing the contrast parameter and again you have the other three items you can customize if you wanted to going right we have the black and white again uh, all four options are customizable scenery applies in intensity to the colors and especially in the greens and blues so it accentuates skies and grass to give you a richer uh, composition and again you've got four options which you can customize yourself the next one is portrait and portrait is a profile design to smooth uh, skin effects so it's a softer profile in, in terms of blurriness it's a slightly softer profile and accentuates red slightly and again you can uh, process this uh, how you want by changing the parameters and the final one is a custom profile and it's almost a duplication of the standard uh, profile and again you can change the pr uh, parameters and you could switch between say one with sharpening and one without sharpening uh, just by changing the photo style from standard to custom so that gives you six options for taking photographs and sometimes it's ideal to go outside and shoot a picture in all for all of those situations just to see how the camera responds so sometimes one of the photo styles that you don't expect to give you a good result will actually turn in a very decent result to show you the benefits of the different photo styles I'll take a series of pictures now of this tabletop display and we can examine those in the video so we'll start by using the standard photo style and I'll take the first picture and then we'll move on to the vivid photo style natural monochrome scenery portrait and the custom menu I'll reset the camera back to the standard photo style so those are the basic photo styles which you can uh, program to your choice the effects of the photo styles are only applicable to the JPEGs that are processed by the camera the effects aren't applied to the camera raw files which are just the basic sensor data and you can post process them how you like in additional processing software you can either use the menu to access the photo styles or you can use the quick menu option and again if you use quick menu then you can cursor up into the top menu which gives you then access to your photo styles and you can switch to them directly without going through the main menu let's now look at the camera sensitivity control which is the ISO feature and the ISO feature is really the adjustment of the gain from the analog to digital converter which is taking the light from the sensor and converting it into a digital value that the camera can process so the ISO really is changing the gain of that circuitry the higher the gain the more the noise is introduced into the picture so let's go through and see how we can set the ISO and what benefits that will give us the first option is to use the ISO button on the four-way navigation dial and it's labeled ISO if we access that you can see we're given a value of ISO so we can set the camera to manually and if I scroll through those you can see we can go from ISO 100 up to ISO 3200 and then we get the auto feature and the intelligent ISO the automatic feature will let the camera determine the ISO according to the scene brightness and if you don't have the maximum ISO limit set it will use an ISO up to a value of 1600 if we use the intelligent ISO the camera will work out the best ISO dependent on the scene brightness 
and also on any subject movement in order to arrest motion. When we have the sensitivity control set to auto, we can actually limit the amount of gain the camera will apply by additional menu settings. And it's down here called ISO limit set. If I cursor to the right, you can see that we can change this value. You can see we can have it set to auto, so that will give us the full range up to 3200. Or I can limit the camera to any value between 200 and 3200. Normally I'll leave this camera set to 400 as I don't like to use a camera beyond ISO 400 due to the inclusion of noise and images beyond that. You notice the increments are complete whole numbers so we're going from 100 to 200 to 400. These are one EV steps or one aperture or one shutter speed uh, value change. That increment can be changed in the menu on page 2 with the ISO increment and we can change that from one EV increments to a third EV so that's a third of a stop between each ISO increments so if I now go into the ISO scale we can so now see we have the third EV increments between the major numbers so if I start with ISO 100 we have the intermediate 125 and 160 before we reach the next whole increment. Remember that the ISO affects both the contrast of the image and the uh, ability of the camera to resolve fine detail. Under normal circumstances you want to use the camera down uh, with as low as ISO as possible so I'll shoot at ISO 100. So at ISO 100 the camera has the most dynamic range so it will capture a greater range of highlight to shadow detail and it will give you a higher sharpness uh, due to the fact that it can resolve finer detail. Manually you can set the ISO you want rather than leave the camera on auto or intelligent auto. So I'll leave this set to ISO 100 to give me the best possible image uh, the camera will deliver. And you can see now the camera is indicating we've got ISO 100. The next option I want to consider is the image quality and if we go into the menu uh, we can see we have a combination of the aspect ratios which we discussed in the introduction with the camera. So again we have the 16 to 9, 4 to 3, 3 to 2 and 1 to 1 format and you'll choose the one uh, relevant to your output device. So I'm going to use 16.9 for HD inclusion of my images. The picture size again you will choose dependent on again your output device so whether you want the highest resolution for uh, pictures for uh, printing or you choose the lower option for inclusion into something like web pages. Now let's discuss image quality and if I cursor to the right the default is the fine quality JPEG. We can also shoot with a lower quality JPEG but an introduction on this camera is the RAW format and the RAW format is the camera sensor output data written to a file in the camera. It isn't being processed in the same way that JPEGs are processed for color and uh, contrast and sharpness. It's just the raw file which you have to process in an additional piece of software, something like SilkyPix which comes with the camera or to use something like Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. Again you can shoot with a combination of raw and JPEG if you wanted to get a JPEG image so you could preview very quickly and if you like that image you then post process it with your camera raw or you can have raw with a lower resolution JPEG or you can shoot in just raw alone and again you would have to process all those images before you preview them. If I'm shooting general photography I'll just use the high quality JPEG if there's something I know that I might want to process for additional use then I'll shoot with uh, JPEG uh, fine quality and include the RAW file as well. So here I'm just going to shoot in the JPEG mode and we'll consider RAW in a later part of this video series. I'd now like to consider how the camera meters for the exposure. Basically there are three ways we can set this camera to meter the subject for exposure control. It's indicated by an icon at the bottom left hand side of the screen and if I use the quick menu I can gain access to that control. If 
my cursor up into the metering mode, you can see that the image at the moment is being analysed using multimetering. So the camera is evaluating the scene brightness by using the whole of the sensor area to determine the correct exposure. The next option is one we call centre weighted and the camera uses more of the centre area to discover the correct exposure. So if you've got a subject that's in the centre of the frame uh, that might be influenced by the background tone then centre weighted will give you a better result than the uh, multimetering mode. It's unlikely the difference will be more than half a stop between the centre weighted and the multimetering so for most circumstances you can leave the camera set to multimetering and that will give you uh, superb results in most circumstances. The final option is the one with just a spot in the middle and it's the spot metering mode and that uses a very small area to uh, determine the exposure. If I select spot metering mode at the moment and then go into the uh, exposing menu you can see in the centre of the screen is a small cyan cross and it's from that area that the camera will determine the exposure. It's important then using spot metering mode to ensure that the spot is actually on an area of neutral tone and approximately 18% brightness. If you try to put the spot on a bright object it will make the camera uh, underexpose and if you put it on a dark object it will overexpose. The cross is fixed in the centre and you can't uh, vary it so you've got to actually move the camera physically to change the monitoring point. You would use spot metering if for example you've got a subject that's a long way away and uh, it's going to be influenced by the background. So for example a city skyscape um, you would want to monitor from the buildings rather than the sky so you could again use the spot metering. Or the moon is another good example of a subject that to, lends itself nicely to spot metering. So at the moment if I half depress the shutter button you can see that the exposure is one tenth of a second at f2.8 as indicated here. If I move the camera to a lighter area of the subject such as here and I half depress the shutter button so the exposure has now gone to one twentieth of a second and if I went it to a darker area we've gone down to a thirteenth of a second. So you need to get something of a neutral tone like this background and that is one tenth of a second again. For the final section in this part of the video I want to look at the focus modes the camera is using. You might have noticed that during this video I've been using the 23 area mode uh, focusing and that's indicated by the green rectangles that appear on the screen which indicate the principal points of focus the camera is using to take this photograph. For general photography that will probably be okay but in uh, some cases you may want to actually specify the point of uh, your subject that you want to be in primary focus. To do that you change the focus mode from the 23 area and that's indicated here by the uh, symbol on the top of the camera to one of a single point area. We use the quick menu to gain access to, to that and again once you cursor to that position on the screen if you drop into the menu you can change the focus method. You can see here it's uh, showing that we're in the 23 area mode for focus. I'm going to move across to the single point. So with the single area focus selected and I'll go back to the picture taking mode the target changes to this square. To change the size and position of the square you can use the focus button on the side of the camera. When you depress that the target changes to the square with the four way arrows around it. To change the position of it you use the navigation button and you can change the position to virtually any point of the screen uh, apart from near to the boundaries. So if I wanted the face of this character to be critically sharp then I'll select the area of the subject like so and then you can use the top control dial to change the size of the uh, focus area. I can make it larger or I can make it smaller. If I make it smaller and center it on the face then that's the area the camera will use to uh, determine the focal point. 
I press menu set to lock that in place and you can see now the focus area has stayed on the subject's face. Well, if I now take this picture the camera uses that focus point and the target changes to green to indicate that I've got a focus lock and you also notice a little green icon which confirms we have a focus lock on the top of the camera. If the camera can't focus you'll see this go red and you'll get the camera bleeping four times to indicate that it hasn't got focus. You can use this one area method of focus even if you're trying to capture uh, subjects like flying birds. What you would do then is to change the focus size to, to maximum and then set that into the central area of the camera. So once you set that larger area focus, when you have to press the shutter button, the camera will attempt to lock on focus anything within that focus area. Here's an example of some seagulls I shot today in the local park using this exact method of the one area focus. Well that's it for this part of the video, it will be continued in part 2 due to the length of the menu and structure. So until then, bye for now.